Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome to our conversation. My name is Eli Nalanga Yonatamishvili. I am the senior expert at NATO Strategic Communications uh, Center of Excellence in Riga, Latvia. And today here with me I have Andra Schratz, uh, who is a senior research fellow at the German Council on Foreign Affairs. Thank you. Um, actually, we are sitting uh, in the very same chairs, in the very same venue uh, as we were about five years ago when we had uh, our first conversation about hybrid threats and security. Uh, so in these five years, I think so many ch things have changed. Uh, we have seen uh, two US presidents. Uh, uh, both of them have had uh, quite different uh, approach to international relations uh, and to how they frame the threat to United States uh, and to NATO. We have also seen um, UK leaving the European Union. Uh, we have seen Russia uh, finishing the Nord Stream 2 pipeline and at this very moment we have Germany negotiating who is going to be their next chancellor. Um, NATO has issued its uh, 2030 reports uh, and also NATO has pulled out of Afghanistan uh, and Taliban is now back in charge uh, of the country. Um, so many things uh, that impact our security, I don't really know where to start, but I'll probably start by uh, asking you, after these five years when, since we last spoke, um, do you as a European, do you feel more secure or less secure? Do you think European security has advanced or...? If one tries to give a short answer to this question, and I'm not sure that a short answer is fully accurate, but in case we try to give a short answer, my answer is a definite yes. I mean, five years ago, uh, when we spoke here about hybrid threats, about the threats posed by Russia's possible aggression against the Baltic states, and uh, about the ongoing ag aggression against Ukraine, the picture was, a much, picture was much darker. We did not know a lot of things back then, what we do know now. We understand the nature of hybrid threats much better, uh, we also know a lot more about how to counter these threats, let it be active countermeasures or uh, improving our own resilience. Plus, regarding this particular region, right now with NATO's enhanced forward presence here with the three battalions in the three Baltic states and the fourth battalion in Poland, this massively reduced the danger of, uh, of Russia's aggression. So all in all, yes, I do feel more secure, but this is of course only a comparative perspective. Because from the same old threats that we have spoken about five years ago, yes, from those, threat, those threats, we are more secure. But there are other threats emerging. Uh, let it be the, the geopolitical ambitions of China, let it be the, the instability in Afghanistan, about which five years ago there was no need to talk. I mean, there was a lasting international presence in Afghanistan. The situation looked not good, but stable enough. And see, here we are with the country turned completely upside down. So, from the old threats, I feel more secure, but I think we need to keep an eye on the new ones. Let them be anthropogenic, so human-made th threats or originating from the technological sector. Plus, one more thing, climate change. Something we, we just cannot avoid, something we cannot ignore, something we can't afford not to talk about and not to tackle. So, more, more secure, I feel, from the old threats, but about the new ones, we need to keep an eye on them. Yeah, and I guess some of them are those same old threats just evolving by the help of technology, just becoming more present. And I think we also see this in the NATO's uh, 2030 report. Um, the language uh, focuses a lot on threats that are multiplying, coming from all possible directions. Um, so, yeah, I would agree that this feeling of general uncertainty, uh, what lies ahead, uh, is still very much present. Um, during these past two years, we have seen here in, in our re region interesting and actually quite alarming developments in the context of hybrid threats. Uh, for example, in uh, March last year, uh, we saw um, Russia uh, setting up a vaccination centre. Uh, on the border close to Estonia and uh, inviting uh, Estonian citizens to come over and get vaccinated with the Russian vaccine, the Sputnik V vaccine. 
Uh, that was, of course, accompanied by uh, targeted messaging towards the Russian-speaking audiences in Estonia. Uh, and also, simultaneously, uh, there were re reports about Russian intelligence services running an international disinformation campaign to undermine the Pfizer vaccine. So all of these things happening at the same time. Uh, another example, uh, in September last year, uh, Lukashenko decided to retaliate uh, for uh, political decisions of Latvia, Lithuania and, and Poland uh, by pushing migrants uh, across uh, our borders. And this has now, uh, well, actually not now, but very, very quickly it evolved from a border control problem uh, to actually an international image problem uh, for our countries uh, because uh, we had to keep justifying why are we not uh, taking these migrants in. So um, these are two examples uh, how our security is targeted in very different ways, uh, quite unconventional ways. And um, in this, in this context, do you think that these type of threats, uh, these type of attacks, if you can call them that, that this will become a new normal uh, uh, for NATO countries? And if yes, then what should we change in how we view and understand security to be better equipped to tackle these kind of threats? My short answer is yes, absolutely yes. So these type of threats are not going to go away. Our adversaries are quite skilled and motivated, of course, that's why they are adversaries, right? Motivated to use our own vulnerabilities against us. The, the good news in the story, I think, that the threats you enumerated and the number of other threats are in the non-military domain, which one could interpret also that militarily, we are much safer than we were, let's say, five years ago. Yes, in the non-military domain, there are plenty of ugly things happening uh, and a lot more is to come. I mean, regarding the, 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 the Sputnik itself, that's a very interesting story from the very beginning, because it shows also how integrated the Russian approach towards using various tools and means is. I mean, they develop a vaccine, uh, they support the recognition of that vaccine with information means, with pretty much targeted to the Russian-speaking audience uh, in Estonia, and they support the whole thing with, with intelligence operations conducted in the West, plus a lot, a lot of business deals about the export of the Sputnik vaccine. And at the same time, when we look back, and when we look at how successful Russia is with its Sputnik vaccine, do you remember when the, the, the pandemic started, Russia launched this medical aid mission to Italy. Russian military aircrafts delivering uh, health, healthcare equipment, disinfection equipment, vehicles, uh, a lot of, lot of um, medicines and supplies. And back then, we looked at it, at what a genius Russian operation that is and see Russians are uh, again ahead of us. Looking back, we know that most of the ex equipment was useless. Now we know it pretty clear that the whole thing was just a cover up for intelligence operation and the, med the medical supplies Russia has been promoting and what you mentioned, the Sputnik vaccine Russia has been promoting. It's far from being a Wunderwaffe. It's far from being some kind of a wonder weapon. Regarding the Sputnik, Russia itself is in a unique dependence. And Russia maneuvered itself into this unique dependence. Because there is a political dependence on the Sputnik vaccine, right? Because Vladimir, President Putin endorsed the Sputnik vaccine already August 2020, and, and basically called that, yes, Russia is going to use the Sputnik V. There is also a production line dependence. And for months, Russia just did not have enough vaccines, simply because the decision was there, but the production lines were not fit for, for producing such a such a number of vaccines needed. There is also uh, a dependence or a vulnerability consisting of the Russian population's unwillingness to take the vaccine. Russians are practically unable to, rate, to even go close to the 50% vaccination rate because the Russian population does not trust the, the Russian vaccine. There is data, Levada, Levada Center has data on the trust in the vaccines. And data shows that in Russia, there has always been a mistrust towards vaccinations. But people trust the Russian-made vaccine a lot less than they trust vaccines in general, which leads us to the fourth vulnerability. Because of the political decision and because of all the, how to call it, all the hype around the Sputnik vaccine, Russia seems to be unable to import Western vaccines. Yes, and, and their own population doesn't trust their own vaccines. 
but importing Western vaccines looks like politically not feasible. And at this point, we are watching the, the, the tragic mortality rate uh, inside Russia. So yes, one and a half years ago, we were wondering how genius the Russian operation was and how much they are ahead of us of, uh, in handling the pandemic. Where are we right now? Who is handling the pandemic better? So I would just encourage everybody to, to be patient and just wait for the long, longer results. This is, this is a funny example, comparing Russia's role and place one and a half years ago and right now in October 2021. We are not faring that bad. Strategic patience, yep. yes. But um, unfortunately, what we also see is that, uh, for example, in Latvia, where we are uh, right now, uh, we see quite high numbers uh, of people who want to be vaccinated specifically with Sputnik vaccine and not any other vaccine. So from that, we can conclude that this, uh, let's say, information influence uh, operation uh, has succeeded uh, to a certain level. But uh, perhaps that is also linked to some form of uh, um, relationship that the population uh, here has with uh, government in Russia, meaning that they don't actually live in Russia and then do they don't experience Russia in the way that the local Russians do. And uh, this brings me to my very, I would say, unscientific uh, conclusion or observation. But it seems to me that um, what we see in Europe is that the um, uh, high vaccination rates uh, are closely linked to high trust in uh, governments, uh, in government institutions, and also in media. Uh, so which is not uh, the case here, uh, unfortunately. and. Um, and I'm just thinking that um, probably this is also the case that the Russian people in Russia trust the Russian government also less, not just the vaccine itself, uh, than maybe those who are happy uh, to take uh, the, the Sputnik vaccine here. But uh, in this context, I wanted to ask you, um, would you also take this uh, vaccination rate as some kind of a sign of how resilient society is, that it's able to tell true information from false information, uh, yeah, has this trust in, in government agencies and is able to actually take a collective decision uh, and, and, you know, get vaccinated in order to make uh, everybody safe and to overcome a crisis. Would you take that as a sign of resilience against also other potential threats? Of course, yes. Science works. Natural science works. The, the, the Western-made vaccines work pretty well. We have really large data sets about the functioning of these vaccines in the United States, in the UK, in many, many Western countries. Yes, of course, in the field of information warfare, one of the tricks the adversary often plays is the false generalization. Yes, every vaccine has side effects, very minimal. But yes, in, in a case one of a million, things go wrong, somebody might get seriously ill or die. One in a million, really low chances. But still, the adversary might try to exaggerate these individual unfortunate cases into a general narrative about the failure of, of, of Russia, of, of, of Western vaccines. This is something it's possible to counter if the society trusts the government and if the society trusts science in general. And just as you said, this is a well-established connection, the trust in public institutions, trust in science, trust in, uh, in mainstream media, it directly increases the resilience to a number of threats, not only information threats, but in this particular case, health-related uh, threats. The same goes also for, for financial threats. A population that doesn't trust its government, that's, that, 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 that is not trusting mainstream media, is much more vulnerable even to criminality and to the wildest conspiracy theories. And when it comes to the Sputnik vaccine, I mean, I honestly hope that Sputnik vaccine will get the authorization from the European Medicines Agency. Because that would be an important relief for many people in Estonia and Latvia who want to get the Sputnik vaccine, for many Hungarians who already got the Sputnik vaccine. Uh, technologically, or the, the, the vaccine seems to be a good one. The problem is with the production lines. As, as, as we are sitting here right now in October 2021, the reason why the Sputnik vaccine did not get yet 
the authorization from the EMA, the European Medicines Agency, is not the technology of the vaccine itself, but the production lines, because the, the, the quality is, uh, is volatile. I honestly hope Russia will be able to fix that and will be able to help its own population as well as other parts of the world to supply them with, with a well-functioning vaccine. This is, this is, I think, a mutual interest. But as long as we are not there, as long as the, the authorization from the European Medicines Agency is not there, uh, the people who exclusively want to get a Russian-made vaccine but can't get it because of the lack of authorization will, will remain vulnerable to the virus. So again, just to, re to reiterate my answer to your, to your original question, yes, I think there is a direct correlation between trust in government, trust in science, trust in mainstream media, and resilience to a high number of threats. Mm. But uh, isn't it so that uh, the younger generation, uh, not that we are not young, I mean, we are, we are of course. Of course we are. Those who are even younger than us, um, their social media consumption and dependence, uh, uh, let's say, on, on social media, where they get their news uh, and, and try to understand what's going on in the world, what is important, what is not. So it's much, much higher. And uh, many of these young people report that they actually don't watch television any longer or read newspapers or do anything of the sort. It, they just scroll Facebook and, or YouTube and, or Instagram and whatever comes up. Uh, if it's an interesting story, they will read it. And uh, what seems to be happening is that um, if uh, you and I would normally go to a source, to a brand, so for example, if you hear that something's going on, uh, where do you cross-check? You automatically just go onto BBC or CNN or yep. you know your local mainstream newspapers page and just have a look. Are they writing about it? Are they not? But what the young people are doing, it seems, they are looking for a story and they are not necessarily paying attention who is providing this story. It doesn't matter. So, and the way they form their conclusion is by pulling together these different stories of, on, on the same topic and then, you know, kind of the best uh, story wins. Because also sociological research shows that they can't uh, often even name the sources. They just say, well, it's Facebook, but who on Facebook, <laughs> you know? Doesn't, doesn't actually have um, such importance to them anymore. And I think this also contributes to this um, erosion of trust into established institutions, into established media brands. They, they don't uh, actually influence uh, the conversation in the younger generation anymore. Are we deemed to remain passive? Do we have to remain passive about, about that? I'm not sure. There is a lot of room for improvement in uh, improving media literacy, literacy among also people who are younger than us, because we are also young, of course. We could teach people. We could include it into the school curriculum, like some European countries already do. Media literacy, media awareness. So to let people know that, yes, it's important to look up not only the news itself, but the source of the news. And, but this is, this is something one doesn't have to invent the wheel. This is something, come on, knowledge is a question of education. It's a question of decision whether we include this into the school curricula, whether we invest uh, into this in the educational side, first. Second, most of the technological platforms, social media platforms, all young generations are using, are in our own hands. These are Western technological platforms. There are ways to have a negotiation, let's say, with Facebook, that perhaps they should step up more efficiently against, against fake news. So there is a solution on the regulatory side. And the third thing, we could, I mean, if our adversaries are investing money into advertising fake news, cannot we invest money into advertising our own narratives? Are we banned from that? Or even if states are banned from that, are we sure that there are no other channels to push our own narratives? Why do we let only the adversaries to spread their narratives in, in paid advertisements? So I see a lot of, lot of improvements here, and particularly when it comes to the next generation of fake news. Technogenic threats, if you like. The next one that is already coming and will be present in a few years, and if you, in a few years I'm pretty sure we will, we will all be talking about them, is, uh, is deepfakes. 
deep fakes, so such video contents which are manipulated to such an extent that they look absolutely real, and there is no way yet to quickly distinguish between a deep fake from reality. And just imagine, let's say, in a Baltic setup, any of the leading Baltic politicians deep faked into saying something uh, aggressive or nationalistic uh, against the Russian speaking minorities. Imagine the destabilization potential of that. Or any politician in, in, in France, in, in Germany, in Sweden, or in any other countries where there might be tensions inside the society. Imagine deep fakes aimed at igniting these tensions. Yes. How do we defend ourselves against? Deep fakes, particularly if are supported by well planned information operations, they, they may have an almost immediate effect. It's not like a long lasting narrative, a fake news narrative that might affect the society in the long run. A deep fake might result in immediate explosion of tensions. So our reaction time will be much slower, meaning awareness alone is not going to help. Yes. Technology will be the solution, or hopefully will be the solution to this technology imposed threat. So when it comes to, to the wider scale of this information or the wider scope of this information, what I'm most afraid is not the, the classic ways of disinformation. About that, we learned a lot. Five years ago, when we were last time talking, we did not know as much as we do now, right now. But the future is already coming, and the future is, is the deep fakes. We need to think about it. Yeah, definitely, I agree. And I think this is um, what we see, that people are now well aware and well used to disinformation uh, being spread. Uh, online, uh, you know, by written word or by doctored pictures, uh, but deepfakes is something that they are not used to yet. Uh, so it's much easier to trick people. I think they are potentially more trusting towards this type of content, which is uh, kind of video plus, plus audio. And uh, purely from a human perspective, uh, eyes and ears, uh, if we can't trust them, then what can we trust? Uh, you know, so this is uh, this is very advanced manipulation. Uh, luckily, of course, uh, there are people who are working on different types of software that is able to detect and recognize uh, deep fakes. But unfortunately, it seems that for the moment, the sort of good guys are still a step or two behind the bad guys. So these uh, technologies to create deep fakes are improving much faster than the ones to uh, recognize them. It's kind of more of a reactive uh, uh, approach. But um, this brings me to um, one um, example that uh, I found quite shocking. Um, in uh, South Korea, for example, um, they are using uh, digital humans uh, for commercial purposes, for advertising, uh, which means that it is uh, yeah, digitally created human, man or woman, uh, looks uh, perfectly uh, as a real person. Um, and, you know, they advertise cars or some other products. And there was a case of a digital human uh, named Rosie who was um, a put on uh, Instagram platform. And as the developer of Rosie said, uh, for the first three months, uh, the Rosie's followers did not realize that she is not a real person. And I, I found that very scary. Uh, and commercial uh, advertising is one thing, but of course such digital humans could be used for all sorts of malicious purposes, um, for, for manipulation, for influence. And uh, I think another uh, point uh, about it is that you can't really take them out. You can't put them into prison or, um, uh, what's the word, uh, yeah, bring them to court or, uh, you know, just uh, in a very kinetic way eliminate them. They just can spring back from any other server where this uh, program is being stored. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I found it quite uh, shocking for myself. Um, I don't know. What, what do you think about this? I strongly believe in technological development. And I mean, originally I'm a historian. If you look back 200 years, how did our ancestors live? From the technological perspective, from the health perspective, from how convenient their everyday life was and how, our li how convenient our life is, the, the development is, is just breathtaking. And with the development of technology, 
is just getting faster and faster. I mean, we who are, of course, young, we remember the pre-internet era. For example, my students don't because they lived all their lives in the internet era, all their kind of conscious lives in the internet era. And this type, this type of development makes us more efficient in, in, in combating uh, diseases. Just look at the vaccines. Uh, in, in, in communication, in, in better organizing our cities, in, in, in countering, clim tackling climate change, hopefully. So I'm, I'm a strong believer in technology. Uh, and if, of course, throughout human history, there have always been cases when technology developed for good purposes has been misused. But this shall not be an argument for, uh, for just abandoning the given technology. Artificial persons, these types of softwares, are conceptually not much different from an advanced virus. It's a computer software, so it, and if it's a computer software, it's possible to counter it. And yes, virtual person, a digital person, one cannot lock up in a prison, uh, cannot kinetically take out, cannot take to court, but for example, the developer can be reached. Provided that you know who it is. This, this is what requires a technological solution. And this is what brings me to my next question to you. Uh, I think that uh, a lot of the time when we are faced with these hybrid threats, uh, and a lot of the time specifically in cyberspace, but not only, um, one of the main problems that the target state has is actually how to communicate about it. Because in essence, hybrid threat is a threat where you can't really tell the origin. So it is always designed in such a way that there is a, always a plausible denial uh, or you can't really attribute it. And then the question is, OK, we understand as a country we are under attack. It's happening. But how do we talk about it to our population or to our political partners uh, internationally? Um, and I think, uh, yes, uh, specifically these uh, technological cases, uh, they are always very difficult to attribute. Um, I mean, look at Russia, you know, the cyber attacks against Estonia 2007, Georgia 2008, uh, United States uh, election, you know, the list goes on. And uh, they have always held this sometimes very narrow but still margin of uh, plausible denial. They say, well, you know, where's the proof? I mean, this is not proof. This is just some investigative journalists making up things or, you know, yes, maybe you detected uh, this trace, uh, uh, you know, but that doesn't mean that it was uh, orchestrated from the Kremlin. Yes, it was maybe some criminal doing it in Russia. Sure. We don't know. And so, we adopt the sanctions. Yeah. So and we adopt the sanctions nevertheless. Mm -hmm. So plausible deniability works only to the extent as long as we are looking for the, the other side to admit that, yeah, we know what. I, I, I am the one who committed the crimes. I recognize and I admit that I'm the one who committed. They would never do that. We shall not seek the other side to admit, let's say, a cyber attack. We do our attribution and we take our countermeasures regardless of what the official communication of the other side is. This is classic deterrence by punishment. And yes, they will keep denying their involvement, also because from their own domestic logic, it's hard to admit that we did something wrong and we even got caught about it. Of course, they would never admit. Mm -hmm. But we, we shall not seek to make them admit. What would it change? We need to go for the countermeasures, uh, and if our attribution is credible enough. I'm not a cyber, cyber security expert. Some of my colleagues are. Uh, I know it's a complicated task, but I also know that in most cases it's not impossible. So if one, once we can attribute, we can take the countermeasures, either sanctioning the individuals or the companies or the states behind these groups. And if the states don't admit their guilt, it doesn't change much. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, this uh, very famous uh, scripple poisoning case was a good example where Britain just called Russia out, uh, even though at that point in time probably there wasn't sufficient investigation in, in, uh, or, or evidence, but at that point they still took the decision to call Russia out and, and we saw how all the allies joined Britain and uh, imposed the sanctions against Russia. So, and we uh, inflicted massive damage on yeah. Russia's intelligence, in, intelligence capabilities by expelling around 150 Russian intelligence operatives throughout of Europe. That's right. This is deterrence by denial. Sorry, this, this deterrence by punishment, sorry. So yes, the other, the other side did something, and then the other side had to face the consequences. This doesn't mean that Russia would never again, again do it. 
That's right, we have to be prepared. And uh, we will talk about it hopefully sooner than uh, in another five years' time. Yep. Maybe next year at the next uh, Riga conference. So thank you very much uh, for the conversation. I hope our viewers enjoyed it. And uh, see you next time at the Riga conference. It would be my pleasure. Thank you.